thank you very much, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to begin also by uh, thanking the uh, Deputy Minister uh, of Justice for convening us all here this morning, uh, and also uh, I would like to thank the Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union uh, for the hard work uh, that they have done on transitional justice and for organizing this discussion. Uh, meetings like this are a valuable means to build a common understanding and a consensus on the key issues and challenges that are really essential for an effective approach to transitional justice and dealing with uh, the legacies uh, of authoritarian rule, uh, of violence and, and conflict that transitional justice is all about. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, contribute today to what I understand is an ongoing dialogue on how to apply uh, transitional justice concepts, practices, and, and, and principles uh, to the context of Ukraine and do so in a manner that contributes to a comprehensive uh, uh, agenda for reform, uh, one that uh, guarantees fundamental rights to justice, uh, rights to truth, and also rights to reparation. Uh, and in this regard, I, I want to emphasize and, and encourage uh, taking a holistic view of transitional justice and thinking and acting uh, beyond uh, just so-called retributive forms of justice. And by that, I mean uh, the criminal accountability, the guilt and the punishment of perpetrators but also uh, including restorative and retributive forms of justice that are oriented to the needs of the victims uh, and also help facilitate uh, the transformation of society uh, as a whole. So if there's one thing that you take away from my intervention this morning, uh, it is uh, that I hope you uh, recognize that transitional justice is multidimensional. Uh, and that in addition to the retributive or the criminal accountability dimensions, there are uh, restorative and reparative dimensions to transitional justice uh, that should uh, be uh, considered as part of a, this holistic approach. So as the, the first panel, as the first uh, speaker on this panel uh, this morning, I, I can think of no better way uh, to begin than by drawing everyone's attention to the definition of transitional justice, uh, the one set forth in the 2004 report of the United Nations Secretary General. Uh, this is considered an authoritative uh, definition and one used by many practitioners in the field. And I will just briefly quote it. According to the United Nations, transitional justice is the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempts to come to terms with a legacy of large-scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice, and reconciliation. So I, I think this definition serves as a good starting point and uh, one way of framing uh, not just my remarks today, but also uh, uh, our discussions in hopes of finding that common understanding about the nature and the scope of transitional justice. I have to switch to less technological means. Um, okay, so as, as the definition uh, indicates, the UN definition, transitional justice uh, is about dealing with the legacies of large-scale past uh, abuses. Uh, and in transitional contexts, whether we're moving from some form of authoritarian rule to democracy or from violence and conflict to something like peace and uh, stability, uh, a number, a variety of uh, injustices uh, always come to the fore and very quickly in these transitional contexts. Uh, they often involve the systemic and widespread human rights violations of uh, arbitrary detentions, of torture, of sexual violence, of enforced disappearances and arbitrary killings. 
but we also can see in many transitional contexts entrenched forms of discrimination and the political, social, and economic marginalization of specific groups and their access to uh, public goods and services. Related to this, we can also see uh, economic crimes, uh, corruption, uh, illegal expropriation of natural resources uh, that uh, belong uh, to uh, the nation, and also uh, so-called extractive uh, industries. And then there are the issues of, of law and order, the fundamental challenges that many transitional uh, countries uh, experience in facing a degraded justice and security uh, system. Uh, one that lacks independence and accountability, that has insufficient capacities to administer justice, uh, to uh, combat crime and corruption, and uh, to provide some semblance of uh, citizen uh, security. So these types of phenomena that we see in transitional uh, contexts uh, give rise to grievances, not only from the, the victims, the individuals that suffered the, these uh, these harms, but also from uh, society as a whole. And failure to address these grievances over the long term uh, is uh, really, it, it it's a ne has a negative effect on the social cohesion and can contribute to cycles uh, of uh, instability, uh, violence, and conflict, and also uh, repression. So ultimately, the way governments and societies uh, address these grievances it's often a critical factor in their ability to restore the legitimacy uh, and the trust uh, in the institutions, the public institutions, uh, that really serve as the foundation for uh, movement to a more prosperous, just, and, and democratic society. And transitional justice really provides, or has strong potential to provide uh, the means by which uh, they can be done, this can be done. Uh, and uh, transitional justice uh, can be applied, the measures and mechanisms uh, can be applied to these grievances that I mentioned uh, and others that occur in, in various local contexts. So that begs the question, what are the transitional justice uh, measures uh, and, and mechanisms? Again, I would refer us to the UN definition, uh, which refers to the full range of processes and mechanisms that can be employed uh, to address uh, past abuses. So it doesn't define what those, that, that full range uh, of processes and mechanisms are. But we can look to several de decades of practice now in the field of transitional justice and distill what are about four core uh, processes uh, and mechanisms uh, that, that form the core of, of transitional justice. Uh, first, there is the, the justice process, uh, which is about uh, the bringing the perpetrators of rights abuse uh, to justice and ensuring some form of punishment for the crimes that they've committed. And this is that ret uh, retributive form of justice uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it is an important one. Uh, and I know it's something that uh, here in Ukraine has uh, been given a considerable amount of uh, thought, uh, particularly with regard to what type of tribunal or judicial mechanism should be or could be uh, established uh, with some uh, attention to the so-called hybrid mechanisms, which I, I believe we'll hear about shortly. And there are models uh, to look to, which we can discuss. But transitional justice is also founded on the, uh, the belief and the recognition that individual victims and society as a whole have not only a need, but also a right to know what has happened, what transpired during the previous uh, uh, regime, whether it was authoritarian or, or conflict situation. Uh, and the most common way to deal with the past in this regard is through a, a variety of ad hoc uh, commissions of inquiry, or so-called truth and reconciliation uh, commissions, which, uh, if properly uh, mandated, uh, structured, and resourced, and given the, the correct powers, uh, can examine the root causes and identify the patterns of violence and rights abuse. They can begin to create a commonly agreed upon historical record and can uh, offer recommendations to remedy the abuse uh, and also uh, take acts to prevent its reoccurrence. Uh, the third process involves reparations, which 
we heard reference to this morning, earlier in the, the, the situation of Valentina. Uh, and this is the process of providing remedies to individuals and, and to also communities that uh, suffered harm. And this can take the form of financial payments uh, uh, through compensation uh, following uh, specific types of, of harm, but it can also involve issues of, uh, or actions of, of restitution, uh, particularly in the area of property. Uh, but reparations should also keep in mind, uh, or, or reparations can also uh, address the medical and the psychosocial needs uh, of victims uh, and involve making sure uh, that victims have access to these uh, services uh, to deal with the physical and the, the mental traumas uh, associated with, um, with harm and, and human rights violations. And then they can also take uh, symbolic forms, uh, such as uh, public apologies uh, and other guarantees uh, of non-recurrence. And then lastly, uh, another uh, core transitional justice mechanism uh, is institutional reform and transforming institutions, not only the security and justice institutions, although they are often key, but all institutions uh, that uh, were involved in, in, in controlling uh, society, uh, often uh, corrupt uh, institutions, uh, and trans, uh, transforming these into institutions that are more oriented uh, toward public service uh, and marked by accountability and transparency. Uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, and some activity in the area of uh, vetting and lustration here in Ukraine, and uh, there are international standards on how to undertake that. Uh, I would just say, in addition to vetting and lustration, when thinking about institutional reform, it should go beyond that into structural reform, uh, also uh, working on standard uh, operating procedures, uh, and uh, instituting some form of civilian oversight or so-called uh, social accountability. So these are four core areas uh, of transitional justice, so-called measures or mechanisms. Uh, but we shouldn't think of being limited in our approach to transitional justice uh, to these areas. In many ways, transitional justice can include uh, a variety of uh, other activities uh, that and, uh, society undertakes uh, with the specific purpose of dealing with the past, uh, of addressing uh, the root causes uh, as well as the uh, effects of violence and uh, repression. And this can be done in a variety of ways. In many ways, there are things that I see happening here in Ukraine now, whether it's uh, uh, constitutional uh, reform, changes to criminal codes, uh, documenting rights violations, opening archives, um, also uh, uh, opening uh, of memorials, uh, and days of, uh, uh, days of remembrance uh, to uh, ensure that the public memory uh, is intact uh, and that there's uh, some effort to raise the moral consciousness uh, within society. So that's a, a brief description of some of the ways to do transitional justice. I'd like to just spend the remaining uh, time that I have to uh, address uh, some of the so-called guiding principles that uh, we can think about and uh, incorporate as we undertake a transitional justice strategy. Uh, first is comprehensiveness. Uh, and this goes back to my original point about taking a holistic view of transitional justice. And what we've learned in the se last several decades is that Transitional justice measures and mechanisms all strategy, again, that focuses on accountability along with uh, the uh, issues of uh, truth uh, and reparations. Uh, the general lesson is that a singular transitional justice uh, mechanism, let's just say a, a criminal tribunal, uh, on its own cannot achieve uh, the range of objectives and, and uh, potential transform, uh, transformative effect that transitional justice uh, offers. And we, there are models we can look to for that comprehensive approach. Uh, also, there's transparency, independence, and impartiality to consider. And for transitional justice objectives, uh, or for transitional justice to achieve its objectives, 
the mechanisms must be embraced as legitimate by the victims and society as a whole. So that they should be designed, therefore they should be designed and implemented to demonstrate that they will be free from uh, political interference uh, and improper external influences. They should treat all participants, uh, the accused, uh, as well as uh, the accuser uh, and the victims uh, equally uh, and fairly. Uh, and then they should be open to public uh, scrutiny. So it's very important to have these safeguards there to ensure that these institutions uh, are, are viewed as legitimate. Uh, related to this is uh, consultations and, and participation. Uh, that includes a variety, a, a broad spectrum of stakeholders, including uh, the victims. And this is really crucial to ensure uh, in the design and implementation of transitional justice mechanisms that they are responsive uh, to the needs uh, of various groups uh, and therefore uh, effective uh, in um, addressing uh, uh, the, the needs of society. Uh, it's also very important to engage uh, with civil society, which I think today is an, a, a good example of. And civil society groups are often essential partners in transitional justice measures and mechanisms. And I know in some contexts, uh, governments and civil society organizations find themselves in an adversarial relationship. Uh, and that's natural, I think, in any society. But to the extent that we can forge uh, partnerships between civil society, uh, and uh, government institutions. Uh, this can advance our transitional justice efforts. Because civil society is a very good way uh, of educating the population on transitional justice um, and goals and objectives, linking uh, society to those uh, uh, measures uh, and mechanisms, and then helping uh, uh, these uh, build the capacity of these institutions or these measures and mechanisms to function uh, as they are intended. And, and then lastly, I think it is very key uh, and something to keep in mind that we need to manage expectations uh, and to uh, do some strategic uh, communication on transitional justice. Uh, they offer Transitional justice mechanisms offer a range of potential uh, to address needs of society uh, and transform society. Uh, but transitional justice isn't necessarily a panacea, or it's not going to address uh, everyone's uh, specific uh, needs. So uh, there has to be some process uh, of raising awareness and understanding about what these mechanisms can do, uh, what they're capable of, and also, it's very important to remember that these are long-term processes that can take, uh, unfortunately, several decades to play out. And we can look to Latin America, where many transitional justice uh, initiatives began. And here we are, uh, 30 years in, in some instances, uh, after the disappearances uh, and the repression there, uh, that, uh, truth, that new truth processes uh, and other institutions are, are, are starting to gain uh, real traction. So again, long-term perspectives really are required uh, and uh, understanding that uh, it requires a considerable commitment, including political will, to drive these processes forward is something always to keep in mind. And so I just want to conclude with that in that you know, the experiences of transitional justice that we see around the world in all regions, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in this region, and also further east. Um, it shows us that dealing with the past is not easy. Uh, and it tends to be a politically sensitive project uh, uh, or process, uh, one that must confront vested interests, uh, spoilers, uh, and also uh, cultures of impunity that are uh, well embedded in institutions uh, and society, along with historical narratives uh, that may impede real change and, and reconciliation. Uh, so I just want to thank again uh, all of you uh, for your interest in this topic uh, and for your commitment uh, and the leadership uh, that I'm confident you will all show in moving this process forward. Thank you.